Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle and welcome to Threshold of Hope. Before we get to our writings today, we are celebrating the feast of St. Camillus de Lellis, who was born in Italy in 1550 and became a soldier. And it's not unusual for a lot of soldiers to get a little bit bored waiting in between battles. And they, when they're bored, they, uh, do you know the old saying? Idle hands are whose workshop? The devil's. And so he was addicted to gambling and various other sinful behaviors. And he became penniless and eventually tried the Capuchins, but eventually started his own order of taking care of the sick. He couldn't become a Capuchin because of a wound that he had received in fighting against the Turkish invaders of Europe. And so he um, uh, was uh, able to think that maybe the Lord was calling him to minister to the sick. And that became very much his ministry. He had St. Philip Neri as his spiritual director. St. Philip being one of the many um, very important reform leaders inside the church of the 16th century. And so he uh, well, started, uh, St. Camilla started an order of uh, the clerk's regular ministers of the affirm, infirm, and they're known as the chameleons, not chameleons, that's an animal. This is the chameleons named after him, uh, took care of the sick. Um, and you know, that's something that's important to keep in mind, that the church is the one that invented the notion of the hospital, like we have it today. That's, that's a Catholic invention, along with the universities and, and orphanages and other such things. Romans just took orphans and put them out there for the animals to eat. They put them out there for the wolves. Um, and the church took care of them. And same with the sick. You know, it just This is an important part of our Christian heritage. And so we're thankful for, to, for him and many of the other saints who had this ministry to care for the sick. Now, we are continuing on with the encyclical by Pope St. John Paul, Ut Unum Sint, which means that they may be one, 1995 encyclical. And in this encyclical on ecumenism, you can download a free electronic copy of Ut Unum Sint by going to the document library of our website, which is EWTN.com. And go to the Faith, Faith tab, you'll see uh, document library. Click that and type in Ut Unum Sint and download it into your computer to read along with us or you can even print out the document. Of course, we'd love to have you involved and participate you can do like all these nice folks have done and come right here to Birmingham, Alabama, Irondale, actually, all right next door to Birmingham. Or you can send a question by email, writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call during our live broadcast, which is on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The phone number in North America is one 800 221-9460, or outside North America, or inside the Birmingham area, it's 205-271-2980. The country code is 1. All right, we are on paragraph 22. And this is uh, a section which the Pope wrote about how the prayer is so important. He entitled it The Primacy of Prayer. Prayer is key to ecumenism. He continues here in paragraph 22. When Christians pray together, the goal of unity seems closer. We can look back on the long history of divisions within Christianity, the number of divisions 
uh, various groups uh, started back in the early centuries, but then, of course, the big schism between the East and the West from 1054 and, uh, and later, as well as divisions that occurred especially in the 16th century uh, uh, between the various uh, communities and the Catholic Church. And yet this history of, div of division converges again because the source of unity is the person of Jesus Christ. It's not our plans and our ideas and organizations and committees. It is Jesus Christ, who, as he cites from Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And this is the Christ who is present to us and to whom we are present when we pray. That uh, in our fellowship of prayer, Christ is truly present. That's what he's taught us in Matthew's gospel, that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. So when we pray together, Christ promises to be uh, present. He's praying within us, so he's inside of us as we pray because uh, he sends us the Holy Spirit. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit gives us the words to pray and helps us. He also prays with us so that Christ, that's why he taught us to pray our Father. Not your Father. He's praying with us to our Father. It's our Father and his Father. And he's also praying for us. He's the high priest who intercedes for us in heaven. It is he who leads our prayer in the Holy Spirit, the Consoler, the Paraclete, whom he promised. And then after he promised, he bestowed the Holy Spirit upon the church, as he said he would in John 15, verse 26. Now ask and I will send you the Spirit from the Father. And this is something that he did. He promised it at the Last Supper, and he fulfilled the gift of the Holy Spirit in the same upper room on Pentecost when he established the church in her original unity. There were no divisions then. Along this ecumenical path to unity, pride of place belongs to common prayer. So all Christians can and ought to pray together. That there's a prayerful union of those who gather together around Christ himself. If Christians, despite their divisions, can grow ever more united in common prayer around Christ, they will grow in the awareness of how little divides them in comparison to what unites them. The more we pray, we you know, as I, I, I'm part of, I helped found a group of ministers here in the Birmingham area. And we often pray together. And we see that our concerns are the same. The welfare of our people is what we pray for. As we want to deal with helping them overcome their poverty, joblessness, and other things. And we also realize that we're all praying to Christ and with Christ and in Christ so that we can see that there's a lot more that unites us than divides us, and prayer helps with that. So that the Pope says that if Christians meet more often and more regularly before Christ in prayer, they will gain the courage to face the painful human reality of their divisions. Now, notice he calls it a human reality of division. Things that come from us, the smallness of our ideas, the bigness of our egos. Those two things oftentimes divide us. And Christ helps us face that painful division. And Christians will find themselves together once more in that community of the church which Christ constantly builds up in the Holy Spirit. We trust that the building of the church 
again, is not primarily our effort, but is an effort of the Holy Spirit, despite our weaknesses, our human limitations, and our various sins, especially pride. Paragraph 23. Fellowship in prayer leads people to look at the church and Christianity in a new way. We see that it's not our club. A lot of times it's easy to think, well, I belong to the Catholic club. Or sometimes, especially with Catholics, it's very tempting to see this more as part of our ethnic identity than of our commitment to Jesus Christ in faith. Sometimes that comes into play. And you'll have some folks who are Catholic. Say, oh, of course I'm Catholic. I go over to the uh, national club of our group, you know, the Italian Brotherhood or the Lebanese or the Polish and so on. And I belong to that. I'm Catholic. Well, when was the last time you went to Mass? Well, I already go to the to the club. No, no, no. It's not about an ethnic identity. Sure, Catholicism has formed so many cultures. That's for sure. And it's hard to think of Lebanese Maronite culture apart from the church or Polish culture apart from the church. Bavarian culture apart from the Catholic church. You can't think of it. it it's the center. But it is our commitment to Christ that is the real center. And so we have to keep in mind that new way of looking at Christianity in the church through a focus on Christ. It must not be forgotten, in fact, that the Lord Jesus prayed to the Father that his disciples might be one so that their unity might bear witness to his mission in the world might believe the Father sent him. That was Christ's prayer in John 17, verse 20 and 21, when he said, I do not pray for these only, that is only for the 12 apostles. Actually, at that point, the 11 apostles. Judas had already left and separated. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. The 11 would be the ones who preach that word to us that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It is very much a scandal by, from people in the world that Christians are divided. Uh, in the Middle East, oftentimes, because of the divisions in a calendar, when the Eastern Orthodox celebrate Easter one Sunday and the Catholics on a different Sunday, uh, same with some of the other feasts. Well, how many times did Jesus rise from the dead? Because, of course, Islam believes that Jesus never was crucified and therefore he did not rise from the dead because he never died. That's uh, in Surah 4, verse 157. So they mock the Christians for having two celebrations, but all it is is a division of, cal of calendar. But it does cause scandal uh, to have these divisions. Uh, and so they make fun of us. And other people in the world make fun and, and exaggerate the differences of Christians and Christian uh, past fighting. It can be said that the ecumenical movement, in a certain sense, was born out of the negative experience of each one of those who, in proclaiming the one gospel, appeal to his own church or ecclesial community. That we say, well, I'm from the Lutheran church, I'm from the Adventist church, I'm from the Catholic church, and so on. And sometimes that caused a good deal of scandal, especially in the missions when people competed for the local people to become Christian and try to get them to join our community. So in the face of that, I came across that in uh, the jungle in Peru when I was working there back in 75. And, you know, the, the Protestants and the Catholics were fighting over, you know, their work with the local uh, native people. Um, and so 
that the need to realize we have to work together. And they did. They found a number of ways uh, of dividing some of the labor uh, that they did. Uh, trans the Protestants translated the Bible. They had experts in those languages to translate the Bible. But the Catholics also were dealing with uh, a lot of the exorcisms and such that needed to be going on because there was a lot of witchcraft being practiced and people's lives are being destroyed by the, those things. So that was uh, another element. Now, this negative uh, sense of you know, competing churches was a contradiction which could not escape the people who listened to the message of salvation and found in the fact of the Christian divisions an obstacle to accepting the gospel. Well, if you people can't get along and you say you all believe in Jesus, what are you asking us to do? Join your fight? That's one of the real questions. And that uh, was a very negative experience. Regrettably, this grave obstacle has not yet been overcome. Still a certain amount of that going on. Not as much. Still present. It's true that we are not yet in full communion. We get along much better. And there haven't been any religious wars in quite a few hundred years, which is good. We're not supposed to fight over our faith and go to war over it. And even then, when they did have wars like the Thirty Years' War, it began as a religious division uh, over uh, one group that believed they were in the end times, but it quickly devolved into a political war. Within two years, the religious issues faded away and it became dynastic. Who was going to rule over what areas? And in, France, the, uh, in fact, the French Catholics were financing the Lutherans to attack the Catholic Holy Roman Empire so that they could take away the territory. It was, it was about politics, not religion. But still, um, we, we still have more things to do besides overcome those religious wars. Despite our divisions, we are on the way toward full unity. The unity that was the characteristic of the Church of the Apostles. Back in the days of the Apostles, that's what we want to get back to. Uh, getting back to the unity at its birth. And we sincerely seek that kind of unity. So our common prayer is inspired by faith. And when we pray together with faith in Jesus Christ, we have proof of that unity growing. And it's in prayer that we gather together in the name of Christ, who is one. Christ is our unity. So ecumenical prayer is at the service of the Christian mission and its credibility. Uh, it must be present in the life of the church and in every activity aimed at fostering Christian unity. We always need to pray when we get together with people of the other churches and communities. It is as if we constantly need to go back and meet in the upper room. That's his model. The upper room, both at the Last Supper and at Pentecost. Meet in the upper room of Holy Thursday when Jesus prayed for unity. Even though our presence together will not be perfect until we remove all the obstacles to full ecclesial communion so that Christians can then have a common celebration of the Eucharist. So we're not there yet. And we don't just sort of go to communion at other people's churches and just invite people to communion if they don't share the same faith. We don't share their faith and what they mean by the Eucharist, and they don't share ours. We need to work through those divisions in regard to the Eucharist so that we don't pretend to be one when we are not. That is false ecumenism. But we pray together as at the, because at the up, upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus prayed for them himself. They prayed the prayers of the Passover. There are lots of prayers we can do prior to, to celebrating the Eucharist together. That's our goal. We want to get there. That's why Vatican II uh, wrote 
in the document on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, paragraph 4, says, when such actions are undertaken prudently and patiently by the Catholic faithful with the attentive guidance of their bishops, they promote justice and truth, concord and collaboration, as well as the spirit of brotherly love and unity. This is the way that when the obstacles to perfect ecclesiastical communion have been gradually overcome, all Christians will at last, in a common celebration of the Eucharist, be gathered into the one and only church in that unity which Christ bestowed on his church from the beginning. This is something that we see in paragraph 24 as a source of joy to see so many ecumenical beginnings, uh, ecumenical meetings that begin and conclude with prayer. There, every January, there's a week of prayer for Christian unity. It's not meant to be the only week we pray for unity, but we do pray for unity uh, uh, in January. Uh, in some countries, they do it around Pentecost. That's uh, a better time for them. Um, and this is well-established tradition now. Uh, there are many other occasions in the year when Christians are led to pray together. Thanksgiving in the United States is a day we often have uh, groups of different Christian communities come together. Also, the Pope has made pilgrimages to the various churches in different continents and countries of the present-day Okumene, the Eastern, right, Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, he was very conscious <clears throat> how the Vatican Council led the Pope to exercise his apostolic ministry by going to these other communities. Pope Paul VI met with the ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern, uh, the Greek Orthodox, you know, at the time of the Vatican Council. And the, uh, these are, are very much part of the, the role of the Bishop of Rome to, to go out in these meetings. He had, uh, Pope St. John Paul wrote about this in his uh, document at the beginning of the Jubilee of 2000, Tertio Millennio Adveniente, paragraph 24. Papal journeys have become an important element in the work of implementing the Second Vatican Council. They become a regular occurrence taking in the particular churches of every continent and showing concern for the development of ecumenical relationships with Christians of various denominations. And he says that my visits have almost always included ecumenical meetings and common prayer with brothers and sisters who seek unity in Christ and in the church. He would meet with the different communions. He met with the primate of the Anglican communion at Canterbury Cathedral in May 29th, 1982. And when he was there, he gave an address saying, the building itself of the cathedral is an eloquent witness both to our long years of common inheritance and to the sad years of division that followed. The cathedral was built to celebrate St. Thomas of Canterbury, who died rather than let the king choose the bishops and control the church. So they, they shared that, but they're also part of their division. Nor can I forget meeting in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries in 1989, June of 1989, in North and South America and Africa, uh, at the headquarters of the World Council of Churches um, in uh, 1984, and at the organization uh, that, you know, the World Council of Churches is committed to calling its members and uh, churches and ecclesial communities quote, in their constitution and rules, uh, section uh, number three, paragraph two, they have the primary purpose of the fellowship of churches in the World Council of Churches is to call one another to visible unity in one faith and in one Eucharistic fellowship expressed in worship and common life in Christ through witness and service to the world and to advance towards that unity in order that the world may believe. So that's what the World Council does. That's why he spoke to them. Also, he um, uh, 
took part in the Eucharistic liturgy at the Church of St. George in the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1979, and also a service at St. Peter's with Patriarch Demetrios I in 1987. Um, and at that time, what they did at the altar of the confession by, in St. Peter's, uh, the main altar, we, the Patriarch and the Pope recited together the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed um, according to its original Greek text. So the Patriarch read the Greek text and the Pope read the Latin exact translation. And the, it, he, he still finds it hard to describe the unique nature of these occasions of prayer. Given the differing ways in which each of these meetings was conditioned by past events, they each had their own eloquence of overcoming some of that division. They have all become part of the church's memory as the church is guided by the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to seek the full unity of all believers in Christ. This is our task, and this is what we want to see happen. And this is very much what Jesus Christ prayed for, and therefore we pray for as well, praying with him and in him for this unity. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in a couple minutes and get some of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. summertime and I know a lot of y'all are traveling and we would love to have you travel right here. If you can be part of our studio audience by coming to Sweet Home Alabama, we would love to have you contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to EW10.com. They will give you information about uh, times when there are programs where you can be in the studio audience, as well as places to stay, good places to eat. We already have one young man who is chafing at the bit to get over to Hamburger Heaven. Uh, he's got to get some of those good milkshakes, as well as good food, too, but got to get a milkshake. And, uh, and uh, also, they'll give you directions on how to get up to Hansful and all the other good places to visit around here in Alabama. So... Come on and join us. Now we have a question. Doug, where are you from? Pennsylvania, Father. Great. And what's your question? I want to know, why was it necessary that the apostles received the Holy Spirit on numerous times, like their baptism and when Jesus breathed it into the upper room, mm -hmm. and then Pentecost? Wouldn't only one suffice? Okay. Now, Doug, are you married? No. Oh, okay. No, that's why you're asking. Now, when you, if you get married... Um, one of the things that you'll see, it is more than necessary to tell your wife more than once that you love her. You don't tell her, you know, I, I, I love you and I'll marry you. Shouldn't that be enough? Better not be. Uh, uh, well, we got married. I don't need to worry about the anniversaries anymore. Oh, I don't think that's the right answer. Uh, you, you need to remember the anniversaries. Why? Human beings, as us, a, a, a race, the human race, uh, has this need to deepen their understanding and their openness to love. You don't get it once, then it's done. There's a constant process of deepening. I well, just because I uh, like to do this kind of thing, but I think of it as being like sandpaper, that you get sandpaper and you keep going back over the spot 
until it's smooth. And that there's uh, this need to keep going at the different layers so that we can learn to integrate our loves. And that includes our love of God. The process of deepening is actually a process of ever increasing integration so that your faith and your experience of the Holy Spirit is not just a compartment once in life. And then, okay, I got that all taken care of. And then you, because what happens is if you leave it in a compartment, you don't allow it to affect the other compartments of your life, like your business, your politics, your marital life, your life as a parent, uh, your school life. Every aspect of life is called to be integrated by God. And the apostles not only received the Holy Spirit when Christ breathed on them on Easter Sunday, as well as when uh, at Pentecost, but then again, after their first experience of persecution, they went back home and prayed, and again the whole place shook. Um, each time it's a deepening and further integration of things like persecution and of preaching and teaching, all these different aspects, just as when you celebrate your 50th anniversary, oh yeah, I think we had, didn't we get married 50 years ago? Oh, that was nice. No, you better celebrate because now you've got this whole experience of 50 years to look back on, of loving each other and raising kids, having gone through the difficulties as well as the joys, and you pull that together better. And that's a great thing to celebrate. And so also do you integrate ever more deeply your experience of God. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it's multiple times. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? We're from uh, Greenville, Texas. Good to have you here. That's up near the Dallas area, right? Right, just yes. east of Dallas. There you go. And what is your question? Well, you were talking about praying together. Uh, the different denominations. Mm -hmm. We used to hear about uh, the family that prays together stays together. Would you yeah. like to comment on that and how that relates to the whole idea of praying together? Absolutely. First of all, that was a saying made famous by Father Peyton. And he got it put onto billboards and such. And in that, it was part of his campaign to have the family rosary prayed. Now, we have run into a lot of problems, haven't we? Does the family stay together anymore? No. Matter of fact, all too often, we can't get the family to actually live together at all. As now, 52% of all children born in the past year were born to unmarried parents. It's, you know, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, the church needs to change its rules about uh, having married priests and women priests and all sorts of things. Then they'll get more vocations. You can't get people committed to a man and woman loving each other and loving the children they bring into the world, yet alone a commitment to religious life. This is the reality, and this is the fruit of the sexual revolution of the late 1960s. It's been catastrophic. What we need to do is encourage young couples in the dating process to pray together. Some of the best weddings I've ever done were for a group of young adults that would meet for adoration together. They were praying for vocations to religious life in the priesthood over in the Dallas area, in fact. And not only were there a number of priests and nuns who came out of that group, but also a number of vocations to matrimony. They prayed together. A number of them proposed marriage before the Blessed Sacrament so that they would see Jesus as the center of their marriage. 
and their relationship. And that gives a whole different sense of learning a, that type of chastity appropriate to those who are dating and those who are engaged. And then prepares you for the proper chastity that belongs to marriage. You know, you, you, when you get married, you can't start thinking, well, I, I, still some other people I could date. No, there aren't. <laughs> Not anymore. You're done. That option needs to be out of your life. And you need Christ to ground your marriage. So praying together as a family is missing as so many people don't pray together and they don't stay together. Is that not the case? And so I urge families, uh, especially husbands and wives, to pray together from the time they're dating. Include that. Now, there are other fun things to do when you're dating, as I recall. It's been almost 49 years since my last date, but it was a lot of fun to go on picnics and dances and stuff like that. I used to enjoy that a lot. But, you know, uh, prayer as part of the relationship is a good thing. And so um, this is a, a, a very key element for families to have. Okay. Well, we have another caller. Hello, Petrina. Hi, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, that didn't take long to pick up that accent. Great to hear from you. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's really nice. What's your question, Petrina? Uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, doctrinal error and the Holy Spirit. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I know that over the centuries that uh, the Holy Spirit has protected protected the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, especially from uh, popes who have uh, been, let's say, less than moral, and we know that they, they never changed um, any of the doctrine or dogma of the Church, and that That's was right. through the Holy Spirit's protection. That's right. And, and I'm wondering today, I'm, I'm very concerned about um, our current pope and some of the things that uh, he's purported to, have, to say yeah. and, and the directions he seems to be yeah. going in. Uh, for example, the whole idea of divorced Catholics who remarry uh, possibly being uh, able to receive communion when, mm -hmm. in fact, you know, biblically that seems to be incorrect. Um, what, do you, what do you think about this? Is the, I mean, will the Holy Spirit protect us, or are we just, I don't know, in the end times and, and everything is sort of going to hell in all areas? No, yeah, mm -hmm. for, uh, Petrina. Yeah. Who promised us that the Holy Spirit would protect us? Jesus. And who said that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church? Our Lord Jesus. All right. So I'm going to believe Jesus on that. And I don't, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if we're in the end times. Uh, things have been a lot worse. <laughs> I know some people find it hard to believe, but the more you study history, the more you find out that things have been worse than what we see today. It's bad. I'm, I'm not mollycoddling it at all. Uh, I'm very aware of the breakdown of our society, and yet things have been worse at other times. Um, and also, I'm the son of my dad, uh, you know, who always said, don't think, you know, about how, how much you don't have and what, you know, that you don't have all this stuff. There's people who have it worse than you do. And generally, that's true. You know, not only worse than I as a person, but also culture and societies have had worse situations. For instance, try ancient uh, Rome. They had 200 plus years, almost 225 years of constant invasion by uh, barbarians who destroyed everything around them. That's a lot of invasions. So uh, for a long time. And they, they thought it was the end of the world then, too. Um, I, I trust our Lord Jesus to, to keep the church protected. And also, um, one of the things I think people have become more sensitive to, uh, even the president of Poland recently sent a uh, one of these tweets uh, about fake news. <laughs> from the visit of President Trump over to Poland. And people say, oh, they insulted the Polish uh, uh, 
uh, president and his wife. And he, he said, this is fake news. And, he, and when the president of Poland is complaining about fake news in America, <laughs> you can be sure there's a lot of fake news when it comes to the papacy. That's why, uh, I, you, with a name like Petrina, I'll bet you're Italian-American. Check even some of the uh, uh, Italian originals. I, I tend to do that. I'll go read what the Pope said in the Italian original so that I can see what was actually said and what was skipped. And in fact, the Pope has not made any changes to dogma. That hasn't happened. Nor to uh, the moral law. He hasn't changed uh, canon law. There are a number of cardinals who insist, and they, they ought to, on uh, clarifications with these dubia. All right? They want those clarifications. We need clarification. And they, so far that hasn't happened. And I don't know why. I don't know the inner workings. I stay away from Rome. I stay out of their business. They stay out of my business. We just go merrily on our ways. Um, but uh, there is a need for those clarifications. But no changes to canon law and no changes of dogma have happened. So um, uh, let's see what happens next. But be careful, especially, of fake news about the papacy. There's real news that has to be attended to, but there's also fake news. So check into that. We have a question from this young man. Sir, where are you from? Virginia. Is that the Commonwealth of Virginia? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> so what's your question, young man? How did they use to print stuff back in the day? Okay, back in what day? Like the time of Jesus? Okay. Well, see, when you say the day, uh, for you, that was just a couple of years ago. So for me, it's a bit longer. And then for the church, it's 2,000 years in those days. Here's what they had to do. In the earliest days of, the, uh, uh, of uh, like the time of Christ and a bit earlier, they had people who were professional scribes. What they did is uh, oftentimes, sadly, they were slaves that, they, that belonged to them. In those days, they had people as slaves. Other times, they also had people that were free, that uh, uh, they weren't slaves, but they, had to, uh, they were paid to do this. And as professional scribes, one guy would read a, a book and, was, and he would say, for instance, with the Bible, in, and everybody would write in, the, and they write the, beginning, that write out the word beginning, God, and write out the word God, created. So in other words, one guy would read and 10 guys would make a copy. And then you, at, when it was done, each day, they'd go over the copies to make sure the guys copied correctly. And that's how they did books. Later on, uh, the, the, when the church came along, the church would have monks. These were brothers uh, who, and priests who lived in monasteries, communities for, uh, for priests and, and brothers. And they would make copies the same way. Or they would see a book and then they would copy it themselves, one copy at a time. So that's how they copied in the old days. They didn't start printing books until the 1450s A.D. And the first book that they printed was the Bible in Latin. And, uh, and then within the next 50 years, they printed the Bible in a, a, a 120 editions in different languages. Okay. So they, um, that's what they did, okay? That's how it was done. And you, if you go on the Internet, you can see copy, ancient copies uh, online now. You know, they used to be just in libraries. Now they've made uh, photographs of them very carefully because if you take a flash, it ages each page by 100 years. So they, so they've been, but they've been doing careful photographs, and now you can get them online, and that's what we do. We, I, I, I look at those and I compare them to the uh, 
text of scripture, make sure that the English and the ancient texts are the same. Okay. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Donna. Yes, this is Donna. Where are you from? Tucson, Arizona. Great. And what is your question? Okay, my question is, I was born, uh, raised, and grew up and lived a life as a Catholic, and mm-hmm. because of personal circumstances, I was cr- cr- made it into the Greek Orthodox faith. Uh-huh. Is there a problem practicing both faiths? By that I mean uh, receiving Holy Communion, the Eucharist, in the Catholic faith, and then on Sunday uh, receiving the Eucharist uh, in the Orthodox faith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, um, you know, here, here's the difficulty. The, the two churches are at present, you know, separated. And that separation it definitely does cause difficulty. Um, in, uh, have you told the Greek Orthodox priest about this? No, I haven't. I didn't think so because he wouldn't allow it. You know, it's against Greek uh, Orthodox practice to give Catholics communion. Yes, but I'm chrismated into the Greek I, Orthodox I, faith. I'm tell, I know that, but we, um, if you told them about this, um, this would be highly problematic. It's not allowed, you know, especially on their side, more so on their side than on ours. We recognize the validity of all their sacraments, but some of the Orthodox don't recognize the validity of your Catholic bap- baptism. So then they would say that your chrismation was not done as a ba- to a baptized person. Now you need to, you know, um, yeah, at this point, you need to make a decision between the, one of the churches or the other. Or, you know, uh, as a Catholic, you know, who, and we recognize the chrismation. You know, it's, it's valid chrismation. Chrismation, by the way, is the Eastern term for confirmation. In Latin, called confirmation, which is a Latin word from confirmare. And uh, chrismation is uh, from the Greek word chrisma, uh, meaning anointing. So that's, that's confirmation. Um, but you would have less difficulty with the Catholics accepting this. And of course, you know, because it sounds to me like you love the liturgy of St. John uh, Chrysostom, which is celebrated in the uh, Eastern Church. Uh, I, I do too. It's, it's, it's beautiful. You may want to look around for an Eastern Rite Catholic Church. I don't know in Tucson. I know in Phoenix there are um, a number of them. Uh, both Maronite and um, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure there's a Byzantine church. Uh, and you might look for a Byzantine Catholic church in Tucson. I just don't know what's in that diocese. Uh, I do know it's available in Phoenix Diocese and in, in the city of Phoenix. Uh, but uh, believe me, if you told the Orthodox priest what you were doing, they, they would not be... Uh, approving of this. So it's something, th- this is the kind of thing we're talking about here. We want to have that unity. I would love to have us, you know, in full communion with the Eastern Orthodox. I look forward to that day. I pray for that day, as I hope all of us do, and that all the Orthodox pray for that unity. Um, but we have to work through these differences between us before, so it can be an authentic unity. All right, I'm going to take an email from Jerry in Crosby, Texas. Father Mitch, please explain Jesus' words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This has puzzled me greatly. Well, let's take a look here in the Holy Bible. If you go to the book of Psalms um, and you see that, that the key to that passage is Psalm 22, because Psalm 22 begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, they, you know, the, the Psalms did not have numbers until a Catholic monk numbered them 
in the mid 11th century, he was an English monk who numbered all the chapters of the Bible in the mid 11th century. There'd never been chapters before that. And verses weren't put in until Gutenberg printed the Bible. He added the verses to make sure he didn't skip anything when he was printing them. That's why he put the verses in there. And then this same psalm goes on. Um, yet, in verse 3, yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. And it goes on to describe, you know, this praise. And then it goes back in, in um, verse 6. Listen to verse 6. But I'm a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what the people were saying as Jesus was hanging on the cross? And then it also uh, continues that, um, uh, let's see, uh, they have pierced my hands and feet in verse 16. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them, and for my raiment they cast lots. In other words, the soldiers had just done that. And by the way, the soldiers didn't know Psalm 22 when they were casting dice for Jesus' clothes. But they were fulfilling the psalm as a prophetic psalm. And what's going on here, Jerry, is that Christ quotes that so that everybody who sees him hanging on the cross can understand that he is fulfilling that psalm. His hands and feet were pierced with nails. His bones were numbered by being scourged. The people were mocking him. All this stuff happened. So that's why he quotes that psalm. Also, as Bishop Archbishop Sheen used to say, it's also when Christ comes down to the level of the atheist so that he can bring the atheist back up to the faith. Because if you read the psalm, you also see this expression of trust in the midst of pain. I have another email here from Zach. Dear Father Mitch, could you please explain the church's teaching on predestination? I have a book that says that God loves the elect more than the reprobate, and that's why they're saved. I find this depressing. <laughs> God bless Zach. What, are you afraid that you're a reprobate? No, Zach, no, no, no. Here's, Catholic teaching is this. First of all, God wills that all men be saved. We see this in St. Paul's letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4. God wills all men to be saved. Therefore, we, the church very much believes that God will give every person sufficient grace to be saved. That's God's will. And there are some people who do receive more grace than others. That's true. There are certain saints that receive more grace than, all, than the rest of us. But their grace is given to them to have that stronger faith and commitment, not because God doesn't like the rest of us, but he gives them a special gift so that they can lead the rest of us with our weaknesses. It's a gift to them for our sake to build up the church. That's why we see the gift of faith is given to some in 1 Corinthians 12 as a gift to help everybody else, along with other gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, some people get more grace, but that, that gift of grace is to help the rest of us get closer to Christ and that we then have to respond by our free will to say yes to God uh, and accept that grace and his salvation. All right. Well, we've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, we remind you that this network is brought to you by you. So we ask that you keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. 
uh, so we can pay all of our bills and especially want to remind you that in these summer months, when you go on vacation, our bill collectors don't. So do continue to remember us. Thank you.